This week we're based at beautiful Fitzroy Reef where we make the best of what nature throws at us. The Weather Bureau said it was going to be 10 knots today. I think it's a little bit more than 10 knots. When the wind eases off, we have some great diving, but when it returns, we look at anchoring in strong winds with our new storm anchor. We awoke at Fitzroy Reef to a fairly steady wind and decided to sail Marul outside the reef lagoon to dive on some of the outer reef passes. Well, the Weather Bureau said it was going to be 10 knots today. I think it's a little bit more than 10 knots, don't you Troy? Judging by that wind generator, yeah. <laughs> How many amps is it putting in? Did you have a look? 15. 15 amps, right, okay, so it's probably 20 to 25 knots. Anyway, at least it won't be so windy underwater. No, it'll be perfect. <laughs> it's a bit cold, I want to get in. <laughs> The first thing we saw when we got in was this small school of batfish. They're extremely curious and a common attraction at many dive sites. With them are some black and white bannerfish. They come in two species, some are solitary and some, like these, can occur in huge schools. As always, we were joined by the ubiquitous white tip reef shark. On the reef, there are many different species of moray eel, and while they look fearsome, they're not nearly as ferocious as their appearance would suggest. This one, being quite shy, was just waiting until the strangers in his neighbourhood got to a safe distance before he could move to a quieter spot. This sea anemone is usually associated with the clownfish from Finding Nemo. This one though, was home to some pink skunk and enemy fish. If you look closely, you can see the white stripe running down their back that gives them their name. In the distance, a giant groper, with his entourage of baby golden trevally, kept a wary eye on us. These fish can grow to be hundreds of kilos in weight. These large coral outcrops we call bummies are especially rich in fish life if they have deep caves and overhangs. Though there were plenty of snappers swimming around me, I took the time to select one that was well within the legal size limit. The presence of a chunky whaler encouraged accurate shooting. A struggling fish would have invited a fight. When spearfishing, we have a policy of removing all fish from the water immediately, and we've never had a problem with sharks. We try and sail as much as possible, but when it's glassy calm like this, out amongst the coral, we're happy we have a reliable engine. after all that crazy weather. It's peaceful and calm. Yeah, the morning of craziness that stopped us launching a dinghy. Yeah. I'm glad that you drove all the way up into the back of the lagoon. Kind of feels like it's to ourselves a bit, especially when you look that way. Feeling pretty tired after a big, big snorkel today in the cold. Couldn't feel my hands at the end. Mm -hmm. 
Anchored inside the Lagoon of Fitzroy Reef with perfect flying conditions, we launched the drone to have a bird's eye look at a spot on the reef that looked great on the chart for a dive. It looked very promising, so we jumped into the dinghy and headed off for a closer look. What attracted us to this area was that it's a gutter and that conducts water to and from the reef flats carrying with it oxygenated food rich water. As soon as we jumped in, the health of the coral with the large schools of bait fish was exactly what we'd hoped to find. These blue-green chromas are often visible from the surface in calm conditions and when they are so abundant they indicate excellent reef health. If you see them, it's worth a dive. Nearly every spot we have dived here in the Capricorn Bunker Group has supported large numbers of lazy, easy-going turtles. With so many small fish present, there were plenty of coral trout that are one of our favourite foods at the reef. Their aggressive and curious nature, combined with their ability to live just about anywhere, makes them a popular species for us to target. Usually a slow approach and avoiding eye contact will allow you to get quite close to them. So close to deep water with a healthy shark population meant that I was very careful not to shoot unless I had a great shot. Spearfishing like this is highly selective as you can see. Returning to the boat, I found this school of juvenile triggerfish, or leather jackets, taking shelter. One of the challenges on a healthy reef is finding a patch where there is no live coral to hold and steady yourself to get the perfect shot. In deep water, I'm neutrally buoyant, but in the shallows, where my wetsuit can expand, I become positively buoyant, and, while that makes for safer diving, it can make things harder on the reef tops. The next day with such beautiful weather, we thought we'd like a little bit more excitement and went for a dive in the reef pass during full flow of the current.
for a drift dive, we just hold the dinghy's anchor and it comes with us. Diving down deep, we could hear the eerily magical sound of humpback whales communicating to one another on their annual migration south to Antarctica. There's a high pressure system coming, so all that nice weather that we've just been enjoying is going to come to a bit of an end for a short while. So we're going to have about 30 knots in the middle of the night tonight. So what we're going to do is just gear up with our Mantis storm anchor. One of the things that um, attracted us to the, the Mantis is it can come apart and that means we can use a really awkward space on Marul. So this forward bilge here, um, under this space is normally where we have our methylated spirits and, and various other stores. Back here is our emergency fresh water tank. But under here was a, it was a really troublesome space and um, you know, now we can use it. There's the shank. Here's the roll bar that's part of these next generation of anchors, which means they always sort of set, which is great. And there's the anchor spade itself. And so this is, uh, this is a 35 pounder. If this was all just forged in one piece, it would be incredibly hard to stow on our little boat. Assembling our Mantis anchor couldn't be simpler. Apply grease to six bolts and then do them up. If you're not so mechanically minded, those six bolts come with a pretty good instruction manual. Here's our assembled Mantis anchor. Um, it's a mighty thing, isn't it, Pasky? Look at the size of it. <laughs> it's big. Right. So it's, it's nearly 50%, um, again, the size of our other anchor. We normally run a 25 pound. This is a 35 pound. Yeah? So um, immediately what stands out to me is this point here that's, that does the digging into the ground, that's been reinforced. It looks like it's just been taken straight off a bulldozer. Um, and when we put it together, the only, the only complicating factor that you might have is which way do the bolts go? The bolts go up, all right, just to, just to leave a relatively smooth surface that's very hard to damage here. You know, you don't want to have the threads damaged. Um, so they go upright where, they'll, where they're fairly protected. And which way does this roll bar go? The shape of this corresponds with the shape on the anchor. So if that looks strange, it probably is just like anything in life, isn't it? Um, all right, now what I'll go and do is we'll go and grab out our galvanized chain because for our storm anchor, I want a dedicated chain. It's the same length, it's 30 meters, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't get habitually used. Our stainless chain, we use it day to day. Um, and you know, like we use it because we don't want rust on the boat. But the galvanized chain, it's the same. It's 516 or 8 mil. Um, you, you see elongation in it before it, it lets go um, and snaps, which you don't necessarily see in stainless. So I've reserved that chain specifically for if we're anchoring in very, very stormy conditions. I guess chain is just a bit over one and a half kilos per meter um, with this 8 mil. So 30 meters, I can put it in a bucket and I can carry it around the boat where I need to. I probably might not be able to do it in another 10, 15 years, but for the moment I can. That's why you got me. That's why I got Pascal. Green chicken. We like to uh, get her to carry jerry cans of water around in, in preparation for that day. No one rides for free around here. There goes Pascal with her morning exercise regime, tottering around with 40 kilos of water. So, what have I got? 
8 mil galvanised proof chain and I've gone and got these, okay, approved for lifting. So these are rated shackles. Whenever you stick chain in a big pile, just mark an end, put a red rag through it, do something, because if you, uh, if you take that off and just drop it in there, I spotted the end, but it's really not apparent where it is. So make sure you've always got something to mark it. Shackles themselves, I've used some nice fine wire here to mouse them. So mousing wire just is preventing that shackle pin from twisting. There's not massive forces on there, but you really don't want those coming undone. I have seen these done out of old shark clips, which is going pretty much over the, over the top. It also means that if I wanted to, I could extend out this chain to 60 meters of chain um, if I wanted to anchor in deeper water as well. But for this one, what we'll, what we'll probably do is just go all the way to the end of the galvanizing here. And then on this 14 mil nylon, I've got about 10 meters with a chain claw on it and that can go, that can be hooked on there and the nylon will give us the elasticity that we want, a nice spring in the system and I'll hang the stainless chain out and it's purely just as weight because you need the weight to be hanging down behind one of these chain claws so it stays in there and stays engaged so even with the shocks and everything else like that the chain doesn't jump out and so that's the system that we we'll use. Our normal snubber in fairly you know, benign conditions, I've used this polypropylene rope. And the reason being is it doesn't have the stretch of nylon. So when it goes over the bow roller, it doesn't saw, like it doesn't stretch over the metal and um, abrade nearly as much as nylon does. Because for all its strengths, and nylon is really great, it's very elastic, it's incredibly strong. But that stretching over a bow roller it does two things. That stretching can wear on the metal, but also it can um, generate heat right inside its core and actually melt if it really gets put to the test. So that's what I normally use. And because it doesn't have stretch, I have this rubber block in there. And as that stretches, that puts some spring in the system. But we're not going to do that with these heavier wheels. We're going to use the claw, like I said. And I have here some double braid rope that's incredibly strong but it's very, very <clears throat> abrasion resistant, but it has no stretch. So when it goes over the bow roller, I'm going to attach it with a rolling hitch to this, and you'll see that. But when this goes over the bow roller, it doesn't soar back and forward, it stays still. And so the only abrasion that it can get is if it goes side to side, whereas most of the, most of the action of the boat will be pitching up and down. So we'll put all this in place, I'm going to use a rolling hitch to hold it. This is going to be the sacrificial line that's going to take any wear, because it's only a short bit. It's going to take any wear that goes over the bow roller. The 14mm nylon is going to give us the elasticity, and the 30 metres of gal chain is going to give us the weight that we need to deal with any waves that come in. We've moved the boat up to another anchorage through the coral and we've chosen this spot because it's got great swing room and the blow tonight is expected to be a southerly blow at 30 knots and to the north of us we've got a lot of deep water so we're really comfortable here. Troy's put the mantis anchor out and we should be nice and snug here. Sorry, baby. That's all right. The camera didn't get too wet. Nah. Okay. Was it rock recording? Yeah. Yeah. That's the camera. Quick, clean the camera. Thank you for watching this week's episode of Free Range Sailing. And if you enjoyed it, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. 
If you'd like to become a patron and support the continuation of our productions, we've put a link to our Patreon page in the description of this video. Or, if Patreon is not your thing and you'd like to help us out, we've also put a link to contribute to free-range sailing with PayPal. 